what Paul en envisions here is a marriage where both parties are being transformed by the gospel to live out and to model something very countercultural and very beautiful. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And Jonathan, today we continue a message we began last time, honoring Christ in marriage. And it sounds like you're saying that if both husband and wife are looking to Christ as their most important relationship, that that is really going to transform not just their individual lives, but it's going to transform the relationship. It's going to transform their marriage as well. Well, the love of Christ is the most wonderful love in all the universe, and his love for us is a, a love that we've never seen or experienced anywhere else. And if you have two people within a marriage who know the love of Christ and are being transformed by the Spirit of Christ, they are learning slowly and falteringly, but learning learning to love one another with a love that comes not from themselves, that, but that comes from Jesus. And that's a transformative thing, and it means there is hope for growing in marriage in a godly way. And anyone who is married knows that we need help. Yeah. We need help in this. And the model of Jesus and the spirit of Jesus as he works within us, he begins to change us and to enable us in our love for one another. Well, if you can, I hope you'll open your Bible and join us in the book of Ephesians today. We're looking at verses 21 to 33 as we continue a message called Honoring Christ in Marriage. Here is Jonathan. Man and woman in Genesis 1 and 2, they're created equal in dignity and in worth, both equally in the image of God himself. But within that equality, there was a differentiation in role even there. Adam is made first. Eve is created from his own body as a helper for him. That's the language that Genesis uses. And Adam is given the unique opportunity and responsibility for naming Eve. Now, that's the original design. That's how things started. But the entry of sin came with a confusion and even a distortion of those roles. The story of the fall has at its heart Adam's abdication of his responsibility as loving and protective leader, and it has at its heart Eve's desire to steer the situation herself. And as we all know, it all goes horribly wrong. And so when we come to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, and we see this call here for the wife to submit to the leadership of her husband, what Paul is actually doing is calling us back to the creation model. He's showing us what it will look like to be children of light who are redeemed from this dark world, who live out something entirely different and distinctive, something that can actually work and can actually bring joy and harmony because it's actually what we were made for. It's actually the Creator's design. And so the call here is for the wife to submit to her husband just as the church submits to Jesus Christ and to do so, verse 24, in everything. Now, the principle is clear enough from what Paul is saying, but the practicalities, as we all know, can be very challenging. There are a whole host of thorny issues that Paul doesn't even begin to touch on here. I mean, let's be honest. What about the abusive husband? What about the unbelieving husband whose leadership within the marriage and the home is just ungodly? What about the husband, and this is perhaps the most common situation, the most common problem in the church, I fear. What about the husband who just abdicates leadership, who is just kind of passive and uninvolved, whose leadership couldn't really be followed because he doesn't really lead? Now, as we think about this call, we can't help but think of painful and difficult circumstances where living this out looks well-nigh impossible. We need to acknowledge, don't we, the pain involved in broken and unhealthy marriages. And we need to acknowledge the very real challenges in living this out. And we need to honestly acknowledge, too, that we don't have all the answers here. Paul gives us some key principles, vital principles, but he doesn't deal with all the complications. Now, recognizing all that, being honest about all that, there are two things at least that we need to consider and bear in mind. First of all, Paul makes it clear that the basic motivation for this command is not tied to the husband's worthiness to be respected as a leader. 
Paul doesn't say, man, these Christian husbands are such shining examples of leaders. How could you not submit to their leadership? It's just so wonderful. Now, he says something entirely different. He says, submit, verse 21, out of reverence for Christ. See, the reason that believers will seek to be submissive in marriage, at, at, at work, toward parents, and so on, the reason is not that we think that all Christian husbands or employers or parents are great leaders. It's fundamentally because we regard Jesus Christ and want to live His way. It's because we belong to Him. It's because we care about His reputation in the world. It's because we see that our marriages relate to something bigger and more wonderful. They reflect the union of Christ to His church, and we want to bear witness to that reality in a true and a faithful way. That's the first thing. And the other one is this. Paul's greater burden in this passage is going to be actually an urgent call to husbands to provide godly, loving, self-sacrificial, and spiritual leadership within their marriage. Paul has actually more than double the amount to say to husbands as he has to say to wives here. The word count, it's way bigger. And we might feel that the challenge for husbands when we get to it is even more profound. So Paul is not commending here a model where husbands can just kind of do what they please and wives just have to put up with it. Oh no, there is a call to radical, righteous living for both husband and wife. And so what Paul en envisions here is a marriage where both parties are being transformed by the gospel to live out and to model something very countercultural and very beautiful. Now, that's not to say that Paul just gives us a giant get-out clause here either, so that the wife can say, you know, I will submit if and only if you get your act together. Or the husband can say, you know, I'm going to start loving you as Christ loves the church the very moment you start being submissive. Now, we don't play that game. That's an ugly game. It's not a nice game. Paul doesn't set things out like that. He gives an urgent and a challenging call both to wife and to husband, and he makes each of us responsible for our response. But what then for the wife in a challenging situation, in a very broken marriage? Well, the call is to prayerfully encourage your husband to lead and to lead well and to submit to that leadership in every way that you can, to have a heart and a will that is prepared to do that. That doesn't mean tolerating tyranny or abuse. Of course it doesn't. And it doesn't mean supporting or participating in ungodly behavior if that's where your husband would lead you. But it does mean prayerfully seeking to submit out of reverence for Christ. More straightforwardly, I think there is a call and a challenge here for the wife who maybe hasn't really wanted to allow her husband to lead, perhaps who has heard this idea, who's encountered this in Scripture before, but has kind of reacted against it in principle. Well, what would it actually look like to prayerfully follow the pattern here in God's Word, to seek to encourage your husband as a leader within the home, to give him this sense and this assurance that you want to support him, you want to follow his leadership, not in a mindless way, not without a, a dynamic of collaboration and lively discussion and all the rest, but to say, you know, as we work through this, I'd like you to lead, and I'd like to follow, I'd like to support you. And I'd like to do that, not because I think you're always right and you've got the magic answer to everything or anything like that. I'd like to do that because God's way is best because I revere Jesus Christ, because I want our marriage to picture well and witness well to the most beautiful relationship in all the universe, the marriage between Christ and His church. It's interesting to think about the way in which Paul has put this instruction together. I mean, if he wanted to set up some kind of a domestic tyranny, he could first give an instruction to the husband, you know, subjugate your wife make her submissive, and then say to the wife, you know, put up with it, or something like that. That would be a tyranny. That would be a very, very ugly thing. But that's actually a million miles away from what he does here. What does he do? He addresses the wife first and calls her to make a willing, conscious, thoughtful submission. Submit yourself, he says. Step out and take up this gracious disposition voluntarily. And then he says absolutely nothing to the husband about expecting or demanding that submission. There's total silence there. 
But when he turns to the husband, he rather says to the husband, as we'll see in a second here, you go and love your wife to the nth degree, giving up your very self for her. We hear language of submission and alarm bells go off all over the place because we imagine tyranny, don't we? And we've heard of tyranny. We've seen tyranny and it's ugly and it's reprehensible. But what Paul has for us here, it's something willing. It's something beautiful. It's something countercultural. It is something distinctly and profoundly Christian. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Honoring Christ in Marriage. It's a look at Ephesians 5, verses 21 to 33 today, and part of our series, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. If you ever miss a broadcast in the series, you can always come and you can listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. You can also listen to the broadcast on the go if you have the Encounter the Truth app. You'll find it at your favorite app store. Just simply uh, go to your app store and look for Encounter the Truth. One other way that we want to be able to connect you with Jonathan's teaching is our weekly devotional. It's offered at our website. And if you go to the website, EncounterTheTruth.org, click on the link that says Moment of Truth. Again, the website address, EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message. Here is Jonathan. And as I've just mentioned, the instruction for wives is matched in a very wonderful way by a very challenging instruction to husbands. And we turn there now, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Husbands, love your wives. It sounds like a simple thing. It sounds like a straightforward thing. But actually, when we see what Paul is really talking about here, we see that it is a very, very big thing. Paul calls husbands to love their wives. And he now gives us insight into the extraordinary character of the love that husbands are to have for their wives. Notice those characteristics with me. Paul shows us that this love must be intentional. That's one key thing here. You know, according to pop culture, love is something that you fall into and something that you fairly easily fall out of. A recent film, one I haven't actually seen myself, has put an old song back on the charts. Wise men say, only fools rush in, but I can't help falling in love with you. (laughs) Whoops, just kind of happened. There it is. Look at that, like tripping over a loose bit of interlocking on the front path in the darkness. Well, it's wonderful to fall in love, but at the risk of sounding too unromantic this close to Valentine's Day, let me say this. True and lasting love involves more than simply a rush of feeling. It involves a decision. It involves an intention. It involves a commitment. True love, Paul shows us, is modeled on the love of Jesus. Husbands are to love their wives even as Christ loved the church. And how did Jesus love the church? Did he find himself just kind of falling in love? Whoops. Was he simply overcome by emotion? No, no, that's not how it was. Jesus set his love upon the church, and he did so because he decided to set his love upon a people who frankly were not all that lovely. It wasn't that he just saw us and fell head over heels in love with us and couldn't help himself but go to the cross for us. No, he decided that he would love us and that he would intervene to save us. And Paul says to husbands, love like that. Love like Jesus loved. Love not because your beloved is necessarily in the right and merits all your love at that very moment. No, love because you have decided to love and love because you have promised to love. Love because Jesus loves his people. Love because your love for your wife is a picture to the world of how Jesus loves his church. The love of Jesus at Calvary, it is intentional love. It is based not merely in emotion, but in volition even in a decision. And when it comes to marriage, this is a truth we desperately need to hear, isn't it? People talk of falling in love, and they sometimes sadly speak of falling out of love. 
And some will say that they simply can't commit to a marriage anymore because they've fallen out of love with their wife. The spark, you know, is just gone. So I need to just now graciously back out and depart. I, I can't stay if I'm no longer in love. I mean, what utter nonsense that is. The spark may or may not be there on any given day. If the baby has been up all night, every night for three weeks straight, if there isn't a clean set of clothes to be found in the house, if the bank account is nearly empty and all there is in the fridge is a bottle of soy sauce and some out-of-date miracle whip, yeah, maybe the spark won't be there that morning. <laughs> in fact, if things were feeling all that sparky with all those things going on, you maybe need your head checked. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's not all about the spark. At the end of the day, it's about a decision that you made at a point in time. It is about a commitment to love, and it is about following through in faithfulness on that commitment. Christ-like love flows from intentionality, not merely from today's emotional temperature, even if there is a wind chill. Christ's love next is sacrificial. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus saw the church's need. He saw the fact that his beloved was condemned, was dying in sin, was in need of salvation, and he gave himself up for her. Jesus knew that the cost of rebellion is nothing less than death itself in the economy of God. He knew that the Father required payment for sin, and rather than allow his beloved to perish, he gave himself. He endured the trial and the mockery and the injustice and the agony, and he did it for you, and he did it for me. And Paul says to husbands, love your wife like Jesus loves, even giving yourself up for her. It's easy maybe to have this kind of romantic notion that you might take a bullet for your wife or jump in front of a bus or something to save her. On one level, those grand gestures are easy enough to contemplate, but in the smaller things, when her needs mean your inconvenience, when letting an argument go rather than grinding her down, when giving her time and energy that you barely feel you have, when being attentive to her needs and yours are crying out is what you've got to do, that's actually where it's sometimes harder. That's actually where the rubber hits the road. And it's where we see the true character of our love. Love your wives, says Paul, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The love of Jesus is sacrificial. We also see that it's purposeful here. When we think of costly acts of love, grand acts of love, we sometimes think of symbolic but very empty gestures. The most famous of these is perhaps a story concocted by William Shakespeare where Romeo and Juliet both end up giving up their very lives as desperate, tragic, and fruitless declarations of their love one for another. And the sacrifice of Jesus for his beloved, it might look like that to an onlooker. A beautiful but an ultimately empty symbol. But the sacrifice of Jesus, it was no empty symbol. It was no mere gesture. No, it was very purposeful. Jesus did it, verse 26, to make the church holy, cleansing her by the washing with water, thinking of the reality of spiritual cleansing symbolized by baptism, through the word, thinking of the gospel as it comes to each one of us, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Jesus gave himself for us with a very definite purpose in mind. He did it to make us holy. His death was necessary to pay the price of our sin and to provide for our cleansing. And Paul's point here is that a husband's love for his wife is similarly purposeful. The love of the husband for the wife is to mirror the love of Jesus. Notice it again, verse 28. In the same way, following the same model, husbands ought to love their wives. Now, the purpose of Jesus in his outpouring of love for us at Calvary, it is to make us holy. His costly, his sacrificial love served that purpose. And as Paul draws the parallel here, he is telling us and reminding us that the chief aim of the Christian husband is to help his wife grow in, you guessed it, holiness. 
The pouring out of love within a marriage is not merely so that a wife would feel admired or adored, although hopefully she will feel those things, but it is so that she will primarily and chiefly grow in holiness. Now, that is a very sobering thought for the Christian husband. Is my wife growing in holiness under my care? Am I encouraging her to know the Lord, to feed on His Word, to prioritize and to prize the kingdom? Is the effect of my influence in our marriage, her growth, in holiness? Is my love purposeful in that way? Is she more holy today than the day I married her? Searching questions. This kind of love finally is rational, verse 28. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. The love of Jesus poured out for us at Calvary is in one sense so outlandishly generous as almost to be incomprehensible. But Paul is pointing here as well to a rationality about it. Those who know Jesus are part of his body, and it makes sense for Jesus to care for his body and even in, to endure cost for the ultimate sake of his body. And Paul is reminding us here of a very basic marriage principle that goes right back to Genesis from the quotation there in verse 31. The man and the woman, they leave their parents and become one flesh. The union is such that two become one. And so when the husband cares for his wife, there is a real sense, a true sense, profound sense, a theological sense in which he is caring for himself. And that is so because he and she are united as one. Sometimes it's possible when things are a little rough within a marriage, things are a little tense, when conflict is ongoing, when bitterness starts to set in, sometimes it's possible for the husband and the wife to become very focused on their own needs, on their own rights, their own interests, and then to start sort of pitting those against the needs of the other. But Paul says, he sort of intervenes and he says, no, that, that's not only unloving, but it is also irrational. The truly wise husband who understands marriage will understand that caring for his wife is actually at the core of his own self-interest. Friends, there is so much here, but we must draw things to a close. Paul gives us a simple summary of the rich teaching of this passage in verse 33. He says, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Those of us who are married, and that's many of us, those of us who are married will just be so conscious of how far we fall short of the pattern laid out here in the Word. And maybe we need to go home and talk through some things. Maybe we need to go home and ask for some forgiveness. Maybe we need to go home and resolve to work on some things with the help of the Spirit of God. Those who are contemplating marriage, well, you've got a lot to be thinking about. <laughs> are you ready for this? Is the man you're thinking of marrying, is he someone whose leadership you can respect and gladly follow? Is the woman you're thinking of marrying someone for whom you would gladly give up your very self? Those who are not married and may never marry, are you ready to pray for and support your married friends, seeing how important marriage is within the greater purposes of God and how high is the bar that he sets for us? For all of us, a high standard, a very great challenge. May God help us by his spirit to be the people he's called us to be. Jonathan Griffiths, wrapping up our message, Honoring Christ in Marriage, part of our series, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. Well, I hope that listening to this broadcast has helped you deepen your walk with Christ. But one of the things that we all ought to be doing to make sure that we're growing in Christ is spending time with Him, developing a devotional life. And Colin Webster has written a book about that called Time Well Spent. We'd love to send you a copy of this book as our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 
7884 or again, EncounterTheTruth.org. For Bible teacher Jonathan Griffiths and our producer Mark Breda, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening today.